Um, yeah, it was a cool process writing it all out, wasn't it? Eh? Flip. I'm actually yeah. gonna. I'm actually going to add this to my coaching now, like write this out, like you, you throughout the 12 weeks, you're going to write your story. Like nice. it's quite a cool thing actually. Like it allows you to really, I don't know, just go back and remember who you were and um, probably sure. reconnect with a few things like, like with one particular pool. Cause I like, I swam a lot and I like, that was where I spent my life in the pool. Right. Yeah. And there was one particular pool, which I flipping. I don't know, it just had like some demons for me in a way. So I remember yeah. St. David's, but their pool, like uh, when I was in primary school, I, um, I was swimming a race and, and, and it was the first time I ever realized that I had asthma. And um, I literally had to get out at the end of one of the swimming laps, like during a race, because I couldn't breathe. Wow. Um, and it was the first time I was ever like a little bit devastated and embarrassed, you know, about my swimming. And then <laughs> classic, right? and I was remembering things like, um, like the inter-house things, like that I, was, I wrote yeah. quite a bit about, like we used to, I remember the flipping tug of war. We used to have tug of war inter-house. That used to be the best events ever, but like, one, two, flip, one, but two. I don't have questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, you gave me a bit of a heart attack for a second there. <laughs> uh, I was like, Mate, I've got questions for you, buddy. Yeah. Don't you worry. So it was so. It felt so weird though. I was like, oh, cool. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I can just look at the screen and talk. I don't know if you like. No, you. It, it is because you'll get into a rhythm. Like I noticed, <clears> like after a while, you get obviously get a bit more comfortable, like any guest <clears> would, and then, and then you like, um, yeah. And then you just chit chat. It's it's cool, man. We're gonna. China, Gaza, the Good. token big fella. <laughs> Great. All guys. about you today, my boy. How's I'm it going, my man? How's it going? Good and you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, awesome, my man. Yes, I'm really yeah. excited to go deep uh, into your life, my man. Oh, thanks, bud. Yeah, no, I'm. Uh, I'm excited, man. It uh, it feels feels kind of cool, kind of weird being on the other side of the microphone and um, yeah, but it's, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what you have lined up. But <laughs> Well, because you're going second, you get the tough questions, my man. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, buddy, buddy, I'm sure they're going to be tough. <laughs> uh, Classic. <laughs> it's been quite a cool process though. We were just chatting a moment before we went on, like um, how sort of therapeutic it is to actually just write your own story out uh, for yourself even and uh, besides your mates isn't it oh totally it's just um it's a really interesting process like writing about your life and and the memories that you have and um when you start writing more and more and more things start coming up and uh it's really like i said it's quite a therapeutic process and as a result of like wanted to just carry on writing more and like more things have been popping up and I've been getting in touch with a few people from my past just saying, Hey, how's it going? I was just thinking of you, blah, blah. And, uh, yeah, man, it's a, it's a great process. I'm so happy we're actually doing this on, on a kind of selfish level because it's helping me in a way, you know, how, how have you found it? Yeah, likewise. And it's, and it's been interesting because after you've written your storyboard out of your life, which is fascinating and I'm, I'm very grateful for the, effort you put in there as well um it's just been it's even prompted me even again like on a whole bunch of other memories and feelings and things from the past good and bad and yeah so it's just it's actually been a great pr a process and um yeah and I, I can't wait to actually get into your story because you, you've got a really interesting sort of life journey and it you know you're still young and you've you've done a lot and you've been through a lot and um i think it's going to be a, a great chat for everyone wanting to get to know you better but also for yourself to just kind of talk it out and and uh yeah put it all on paper and this is you you know yeah yeah for sure but it's uh, it's also like interesting i'm like thinking really my story is just normal you know what i mean it's like there's yeah. nothing really like great in there or whatever it's just i guess maybe <laughs> most people feel like that but it's important to remember that to other people, your story is interesting. And this is, this is what we found out a lot about the podcast, isn't it? Like other people, everyone has a story and, and we, exactly. we actually just need to realize that. And, and there's something in your story that other people can will like, obviously dislike as well, but like they'll, 
they'll learn from and, and, you know, just see a different side of you, which is I think important. Yeah. And just they'll take, you can always take something from, from someone else's story. And I think, as we mentioned last time, it it is about time that we, we did this process ourselves um, for that exact reason, you know, just to, yeah, just to know that there's everyone actually has something that we can connect to and, and, you know, vibe with. So it's really exciting. Yeah. And, and the other thing, Craig, which, um, I've realized as part of this process, um, my whole life I've loved people's stories and I only ever used to read autobiographies. That's literally all I ever used to read. So you name it, I've probably read their autobiography. It's so, it's so interesting. Like now going back and realizing that, wow, my whole life I've been interested in people's stories. Um, my whole life I've liked people. Now we, we have, we run a podcast about people's <laughs> stories and the last three books I've read um, and listened to are once again, all autobiographies. Um, yeah. It's just really, it's just so interesting. All these connections, yeah. but it's, uh, I don't know what it means, but it's just kind of interesting <laughs> being conscious and aware of them. But hundred percent, man. And there are a lot of connections, like you said last time uh, with our stories as well, which, um, maybe is, you know, how we led, how we were led to become mates and, and interesting how our childhoods were actually quite similar, but um, probably a good time to, to start delving into that a little bit. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's kick it off, my man. So anyone who, who knows you will recognize the Vali or Joe Berger in you. That's for you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Joe Berger has a certain reputation, but, but what was life growing like growing up in Lone Hill back in the day? Yes, but um, I only really have like cool memories of growing up. Hey, I, um, yeah, we grew up in, I mean, I grew up in a few little places before Lone Hill, um, which I don't really recall, but I, I now see photos. I think I was in a place called Bedford View and Bears Valley. And then <laughs> we, we moved to Lone Hill when I was like, I don't know, two or something like that. And it was so cool. We lived on this little, it, like a circle sort of road. It was called the Gratitude Circle, I think, <laughs> number 95. <laughs> and um, we used to like, I don't know, I just remember just having so much fun in the streets back then. It was like old days at the back of the house. Because this was Lone Hill. This was back in the day, right? Like when Lone Hill was, there was almost nothing there. Like you, you literally wouldn't recognize it um, when, if you go there now. And um, the back of the house was like just felt everywhere. Like just, you know what I mean? Like proper felt, <laughs> which, was, which was so cool now. And I only remember that now that you just, that you just said that. This. And, um, and then we had this, this, like I said, this road. And we used to ride our bicycles around this road, like with all the kids. And there was quite a few kids that lived there too. Um, it was a family of three boys, the dirt burners who lived at the top of the streets and then some other mates that lived down. Actually, my godmother, um, she, sorry, godmother, she lived um, down the road and she had a little family of kids, like a little family. She had a family um, and, uh, you know, like four kids. And yeah, it was just, I don't know, but I just have like really fond memories of growing up and um yeah, I mean, that, that was it really. <laughs> um, it sounds pretty idyllic though. And it's crazy how towns and cities change here. Yeah? Like you must have, if you go to Lone Hill now, it's like a completely different place. It must, it must be quite strange for you in some ways checking Lone Hill out now. Yeah, it is actually. Um, you know, and getting in and out of Lone Hill now these days is an absolute mission. There's like yeah. the road structure has not changed. There's literally <laughs> like one road in and out. And the traffic is an absolute nightmare, but, um, but it's cool going back because, um, actually my, my dad, he still lives in Lone Hill and, um, he lives like near this, they've got the Lone Hill dam. And I recall actually, I used to go down to the Lone Hill dam quite a bit and a funny story. I remember one time we went there and we used to go fishing and they used to have these things called, I think they were called cop. And they were ugly fish, right? <laughs> and I used to go down there. And I remember once going down, I used to go down with my mates. But then like one time we went down with uh, my, just me, my dad and my sister. And um, yeah, we were fishing and, and having a good time. And then 
my sister walked down to the edge of the bank and it was a little bit slippery and she just fell like head <laughs> first into the dam. Oh, uh, and she burst into tears. I, oh. still, I can literally still remember it. And then that was the end of our thing there. And like we, but, but she was just covered like, oh, so like damn wet, water, damn water, you know? Then, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, oh, uh, it's so funny just recalling all these memories. It's so cool to remember that stuff, but you also spent, a lot of time in hospitals and on building building sites, didn't you? You must have had some sort of quite interesting memories of those yeah, places. For sure. So my mom was a nursing sister and, um, you know, she used to work in quite a few different hospitals and after, after work on some days, sorry, after school on some days, I would go and spend time with her in the hospitals. Uh, she worked for like, uh, plastic surgeons a lot of the time so it was in like her own uh, they were in their own offices um, but then she'd also take me around the wards and you know meet the ladies that she knew and stuff and it was yeah it was cool man it was cool I I, <laughs> I remember a couple of funny things like my mom used to like I said work for a plastic surgeon and <laughs> she used to give me <laughs> silicone breasts, but to let me play around with like, I don't know if you, if it was the same with you, but when we were young, marbles was such a big thing. Like yeah. play marbles <laughs> at school and stuff. And you used to like, win marbles and play, you know, when you used to get them in the holes and stuff. But, yeah. uh, but anyway, I don't know why I said that, but, but <laughs> I used to like pretend these, um, silicone breasts were were like Big. marbles and whatever and he used to just throw them around the office and <laughs> but i had no idea what they were to be honest with i think later on down the state down down the line my mom <laughs> told me what they were and i just thought it was i didn't like i didn't really know you know just like, <laughs> whatever <laughs> um so yeah that was that was funny and then yeah my dad he's a, he's a civil engineer and you know he grew up basically or worked on building sites because that's what he did. He built big commercial buildings and, and it was really cool. I, I just remember going there and like he would always give me, cause you have to have like the proper protection. So he'd give me one of those site helmets and they're always obviously way too big for me. <laughs> and um, he would put that on me and I'd just go walking around the sites with him. And yeah, it was cool, man. Like, once again, I <laughs> don't know if we're going to go there, if it's one of the questions, but <laughs> uh, he, um, he built Soccer City, uh, the original Soccer City, where they had the, I think it was a 2010 Soccer World Cup final. And it was, it used to be like a, wow. sunken, a sunken stadium, right? So it was like deep, deep into the ground. It was, a, I think it was quite a unique sort of stadium. And um, they built this massive moat around it, like literally like as if it was a castle. It was like to prevent the supporters, I'm assuming, getting onto the, the pitch because in South Africa, the supporters are just crazy, right? In soccer. <laughs> <laughs> and so there was this massive moat. It was empty, but I mean, it was impossible to, to like get in and out, basically. It was like a, wow. I don't know, five meter drop and it wow. was probably four meters across sort of thing. So it was huge. Jeez. And I used to, yeah, he used to allow me to go in the moat and that was, uh, that was really cool. And then I used to get to kick my rugby ball on the, on the, soc on the, on the oh, soccer really? field, which was just so cool. He's got this awesome picture of me as a youngster. Like, I don't know how old I was. I was, I was like maybe eight, nine or something. And I'm kicking a rugby ball on the, on the pitch, which was, yeah, oh. it's a, such a cool photo now that I look back at it. Jeez. That's amazing, man. You must have had such, as a, as a kid, to be able to get onto those big fields, it must have seemed so massive and just like inspiring and like awesome in the true sense of the word. Eh? Oh, it was all of that. It was all of that. Seriously, I was just like, oh my word, chick. <laughs> I mean, yeah, uh, like, you know, there's going to be famous oaks on this field one day and here yeah. I'm just kicking a rugby ball. Maybe I'll be, maybe I'll be back one day. Who knows? <laughs> So cool. it, it was cool, man. I really, wow. yeah, I really enjoyed it. So super interesting parents and, you know, it's cool that they were cool with having you on there, you know, around them. But you guys um, also had a holiday home, which is fairly common for, for a lot of South Africans, especially in Joburg. Um, and you had a, a place down in the, in a sort of beautiful area down on the South coast. And what did you guys get up to there? What, did, what does a typical little holiday look like? Mm. 
it was a place called um, a, a town called Hebedin, which and the the place was called Lejedin, as far as I remember, like the where all the houses and stuff were, and I don't know, I just remember cool cool um, cool times. But so we would always like that part of the coast. There was a whole load of like beaches and stuff. Like you had, I think, um, St Michael's and. Port Shepston and Yvongo and all these cool beaches like that were, I don't know, within like an hour drive of, of Hebedin. And we used to just, you know, it was, it was, I don't know. I just used to love it so much. So it was a typical day. It was basically, you know, wake up and whatever, have brekkie and, and pack the bags early. And you'd, you'd always pack food. Like, I don't know, we always made food, you know what I mean? And that's always, that's been a theme my whole life, I guess. And you'd make your food for the day and it would always be cool things like, I don't know, sandwiches and boiled eggs and pork <laughs> sausages and <laughs> you know what I mean? And get it, get, get all your, your tiles and, and all the, the bats and balls and, and games and whatever, you know, and then you'd head to the beach and yeah, you'd go and just play in the beach literally all, well, not all day, but probably till like, like two o'clock in the afternoon, you know, and, and that was when it wow. was like, okay, cool. We, we've had a, we've had a great day. And then, and then on the way home, I don't think, I don't know if it was there, but I always recall like, we'd always like get like fresh loaves of bread and you'd oh. buy like fresh loaves of bread and you'd go home and you'd have like peanut butter on bread and whatever. Oh. And it was just so, so nice, you know, like the bread <laughs> was still warm. Baby. <laughs> and, um, yeah, man, it was just good memories, and and the place was also cool. It was it was like like a lot of places in South Africa, you know, they they're surrounded by security fences, um, but inside it's really cool, and all the houses are basically on the outside, and then in the inside there's like normally a leisure center with uh, the things to do like table tennis and um, swimming pool and and these sort of things. And I used to love table tennis as well. Like just (laughs) playing table tennis was awesome, but actually one, one interesting story I remember about it. My sister and I were on our skateboards. So like we had skateboards, right. Um, and yeah, I think I had like the, the thick one, like you could get the the old thick ones, but then there were also the the plastic thin ones. And, um, because my one was the thick one, we could we could sit on. I was ne- I was always useless at skateboarding, first of all. <laughs> but I could I could literally almost never stand on one. I'd just fall over, especially going downhill. So I always used to sit down. Like I was like sitting down so much cool because you can go so much faster <laughs> and like hold on the sides and have control, you know. And then, so the one time we were, it was actually the same day we were leaving back to Joburg, and um, my sister and I were were going down it. And, and we're going down this hill, but, but we were both sitting on my skateboard and uh, we, we were going down this hill and we were both sitting on my skateboard. She, I was in the front or I was, I don't know, I was the back or front, I can't remember. And just before we got to the bottom, we wiped out. Oh, and, yeah, I know. <laughs> but both of us had these like huge grazes down like oh, our legs man. and our bums oh, and all these God. sort of things. And it was like, and, and then we had a six hour uh, drive and they burn and uh, and we both literally had to lie on our sides the whole way back to joe oh it was funny those are the best memories though yeah yeah yeah. no it's such good (laughs) memories but (laughs) that's man you actually you mentioned the legend a second ago your sister ali Uh, i presume you'd you'd go down you know with her and maybe tell us a little bit about her and uh your guys relationship yeah man we always I only really ha- like have any like just fond memories of uh, enjoying times together as a brother and sister. Um, I don't like remember any like there was n- never any jealousy or anything like that. It was just always laughs. Um, you know, we used to, yeah, we just used to. So like in high school, I, I remember particularly. So um, I had started high school a few years before her and then she came. Um, but uh, that's not really part of the story. But uh, we would come home after school because the, the school was actually just up the road from where we lived, uh, which was awesome. And um, we would come home and we'd literally, uh, we'd probably do our homework, I think. And then we'd get in the swimming pool and we'd probably spend, no jokes, like 
two to three hours in the swimming <laughs> pool playing just her and I, but and we had like <laughs> so, cool. so many different games. I mean, Marco Polo was huge, although <laughs> Marco, Marco Polo was much better with a lot of people. Um, but we used to play this one game, which was honestly, it's amazing what kids like <laughs> entertain themselves with, but we had, a, we had a tennis ball and um, you we would swim the width of the swimming pool, which wasn't long. I mean, it can only have been about three meters max. And one would go underneath and one would go on the top. And the person who had the tennis ball would always go underneath. And then <laughs> you had to release the tennis ball uh, so that you could try and make it go to the top before the other person could get it. <laughs> oh, cool. So we would do that for hours. And then you guys made this one up somehow. Yeah, I don't know how, but we literally <laughs> just made it up. And then... Cool. And then there was other ones like you'd have uh, would have marbles, right? Marbles. I used to love marbles, right? And you'd, <laughs> you would um, stand with your back to the swimming pool and you would both like have the marbles in your hand and you'd throw them over your head into the swimming pool. And, you know, because swimming pools, like they, they slant downhill, yeah. they would, uh, the swimming, the, these marbles would roll down the bottom of the pool and then whoever could get the most was like the winner and you had to like get them and then put them at the uh, back at, at the pool, at the deep end of the pool. And yeah, it was just like, just remember those things. It was so much Would you fun. guys get to keep those marbles that you got, that you got or, or would you, would you share each other's marbles? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, they, they were both of ours, so I don't, <laughs> but it was just, it was about, it was about like who got the most, you know what I mean? You would keep score <laughs> and whatever. Ooh, and, um, and then, yeah, like I always remember my mom going, okay, you guys get out the pool. You guys get out the pool now. It's time for dinner. <laughs> and we would be like, okay, cool, ma. And then we'd <laughs> like another 20 minutes or so. <laughs> and then she would scream, you guys, come on, eating dinner. Otherwise, you're not going to eat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, funny. And oh, set the table. Mothers. Like, like, you, like <laughs> your, your folks as well. Like, come on, you've got to set the table. And we're like, okay, okay, we're coming. And then your fingers would be like all wrinkly, you know, oh. and you're, you know what I mean? And, and you'd be shivering a little bit because you're actually so cold. But it was, I don't know, but just good times. <laughs> it's amazing how kids don't get cold at all, like for hours in a mm. cold pool. But then when you're out, then you're like shivering and freezing cold. <laughs> tell me about it. Tell me about it. <laughs> so you guys had a great relationship, but there was some more sort of sad times. And, and sadly enough, um, your parents ended up going their separate ways. Uh, and obviously, that's, it's a sad time for, for everybody involved. But how, how did it affect you sort of then and now? When you look um, back on it, yeah. When I look back on it, um, I, I still remember the exact time that it happened. Uh, my my dad was sitting outside uh, our house, like in, on like the patio. This was in Lone Hill, and th this was also by the swimming pool. And and I just remember him sitting there, and. I was standing right next to him for some reason. And, and I remember being like <laughs> completely naked, but I probably had my swimming cozy on because I was probably spending time in the pool. And him telling me like, yeah, that's, you know, him and my mom are, are divorcing and splitting up and that we need to go. And I just stood by him and I couldn't, I couldn't understand. I was young. I think I was like eight or, or nine or something like that. And I just, I just like stood there and I still remember these chairs. They were these red, like metal chairs. And, um, I just remember like holding onto the chair and him not understanding, you know, not wanting to let go because I don't know, I think I was quite a, like a soft little kid, you know, and, um, quite compassionate and emotional and stuff. And yeah. And I just, I didn't get it. And then, and then my mom she was still there uh, at the house and I remember running to the bathroom and she was in the bath. My mom used to love her baths. So I'm sure she still loves her baths. <laughs> She'd be in the bath and I went and I, and I, I, once again, I just, I don't, I can't remember what I said at all, but um, I was just like very sad and I, I think I was crying and I was like, well, oh, what's going on and blah, blah. And I don't know what I said or anything like that, but, but I just do remember it at the time, like, you know, just being super sad that it was happening. And, and I think we actually left either that night or the next day and Jeez. me and my sister and my mom, we went to go stay with, uh, with one of my mom's friends, this lady, Linda, 
and we stayed with her for like three months. And I don't necessarily remember seeing my dad during that time that much. Um, look, it was a, you know, uh, it was a messy divorce, that's for sure. And there was a lot of anger and a lot of um, dislike and, and hate. And I don't know, you know, I mean, who, who knows, but, but it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a nice um, uh, se- separation, basically. Mm. Um, I think as kids, we got caught in the middle a fair bit, uh, which at the time I had no idea. You know, I had no idea. I was just this little innocent Mm. little nine-year-old boy you know who who just as as most kids you just I guess you don't get it um and yeah so I think it affected me quite a bit but but it did and it didn't you know like you're a kid you kind of don't necessarily know I mean I do remember going to uh, see a psychologist a fair bit um and all I really remember is drawing (laughs) pictures so um (laughs) That was some good pay that she got. That's for sure. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, it was. It it did it did affect me. I think later on, um, you know, in high school and stuff, and not not that I was really one hundred percent aware because when you're in it, you you're not as conscious as you yeah. are as you know what I mean. You're just in it. Mm-hmm. You're involved in it, and um, it wasn't easy. That's for sure. Um, I, I know that like, especially in high school, I, I always felt that I almost needed to lie. Like if I wanted to see my old man, um, mm. and yeah, and it was just, I don't know, it was just difficult, but, um, and, uh, I, I, yeah, that, that's pretty much my, my, my memory of it. But, uh, and, and it was sad as well. I, there was times where I didn't see my old man for a, for a couple of years, um, at mm. a time. and you know, I'm sure one day, like I'll, I'll get to the, the real truth of it. Um, and I do kind of know like a couple of things now about, you know, why my mm. mom was like this and why my dad was like that and stuff. And, you know, but every relationship has, has its issues and lots of people get divorced and stuff. And, um, sure. you know, I think parents are, are actually trying to do their best at the time, but also when there's a lot of hate and a lot of anger, uh, you don't make the best decisions and, and um, everyone does it, you know, it's part of life. It's part of the learning process. And I'm sure that uh, both my folks would have done things probably a lot differently, um, you know, because I don't know, you just do, you just learn, you, you, you get, uh, you just get more wise the older you are, yeah. but in the, in the moment um, you, you do what you probably feel is right. And yeah. um, that's honestly what I believe. But I, I mean, I only, I mean, I just love my folks deeply, both of them, you know, and I always used to cherish the times that I had with them. I, I, I loved it. Like I, I love spending time with my mom. I love spending time with my dad. I love spending time with my stepdad and I love spending time with my stepmom. And like, they all brought so many cool things, um, to my life and, and just all such different people and, Mm. um, just added so much value, you know, and, and, um, now, now looking back and, and now, now it doesn't affect me at all. I mean, I'm older, I'm wiser, I'm mm. able to have honest conversations with my folks. I'm probably closer now than ever to all my parents, um, which is such a nice feeling. I think like technology has made it easy to stay in touch. Um, mm. I love audio notes <laughs> my, mom, <laughs> my mom loves audio notes more than most people we have That's like good, decent good, length ones decent length <laughs> she, i think she topped it the other day with a 25 minute <laughs> which was amazing <laughs> but it's cool man you know what i mean like yeah it was it was tough at the time but um like i said i think parents and people do what they think is right and in, in you know in the moment mm. um so so yeah that's probably it but sure man and then also you know we we have to remember that our parents are still human beings just like us and they also make mistakes and we make mistakes and we all just we're all in this together at the end of the day and it's it's hard when when it's your own parents because you think you know they they you idolize their own parents you know and, and they can't do anything wrong but when you realize that 
we're all just bloody trying our best. You know, it's, um, it's just one of those things, isn't it? It is exactly, exactly. I mean, Jeepers, I look back at my relationships that I've had in my life and I'm like, wow, Gareth, you're a real dick in a lot of those. And, yeah. you know, that's like relationships with girls and then also some mates, you know, like you just, I don't know, you just make bad decisions and you say the wrong things. Yeah. And, um, but it's you a learning it process. Time. Yeah, it's a learning yeah. process. You know what I mean? Like, you've got to say, you've also got to accept that you made a mistake as well. I think a lot of the time and, yeah. and you've actually got to, you've got to make, you've got to try and make amends. I, I think if you, if you truly want to be a good person and, and honest with yourself, you've got to take responsibility for a lot of things. And um, yeah. I think that's an important part of the process that, that doesn't get done a lot of the time that that mending doesn't happen. And people are maybe, you know, and all of us are like, sometimes it's just a bit too proud or our egos get in the way. And yeah. I think, I think that that's what stops a lot of things from actually ever getting sorted out. Um, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, either way, like you said, it, it makes you the person who you are, these things we go through. And uh, if you, you basically someone that has, you know, lots of friends and is super smiley and gregarious and by the sounds of it, you've always sort of had the side to you, even at, at school as a youngster, didn't you? Yeah, I don't know what it is. Eh? I just, for some reason, I was just a happy little guy. I was, I think I was very, always smiley, like always glass half full and just really enjoyed the moment and really enjoyed being around people. And I guess, I think I got away with a lot as a, as a youngster, just because I was smiley. I was probably a little bit cheeky. <laughs> Um, I probably pushed the, you know, pushed the envelope a little bit with, especially with school teachers. And, um, for some reason I, I feel like they like me, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> I, probably if you ask most of my mates or whatever, they'll tell you that I'm like the teacher's pet, uh, or I was a teacher's pet and a suck up and stuff. But I honestly don't think that I, I was like, like I would never did that with any intention whatsoever. I, yeah. I just, I don't know. I just fortunate that I had like cool relationships with teachers and um, just got on with them for some reason. And maybe they saw this other side to me that I didn't really know. Um, and that they, I don't know, they just liked it. But, uh, but yeah, I was always just, I don't know why, just always inclined to be generally happy, laughy, smiley. I would, I'd love to do like practical jokes and um, always be a little bit sarcastic and, and these sort of things. And, um, <laughs> and yeah, of course, I guess at some point along the line, you rub some people up the wrong way, but, but overall probably, um, yeah, probably it, it works. It works in the right way and more positive than <laughs> most of the time. How could, how could you uh, get upset with that big smiley face? It's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> so you had lots of, um, obviously influences that we mentioned, but, I'd love to just come briefly back to your folks. Um, they're obviously people that have both inspired you, as you mentioned, in, in different ways, aren't they? Hugely. Like, I always remember, like, just looking up to my mom as a kid, and I was just, I was so proud of her. Like, she was a sports machine, seriously. And, I mean... She she grew up as as all our folks did during a part the apartheid era in South Africa and she was like a, this amazing swimmer and diver as well and uh, she was just so good like she, I just remember her always telling me these stories about her swimming and her training and all these stuff and I always just wanted to be like her I always just wanted to um, be as good as her in swimming and. Um, yeah, and I remember, I remember we used to do a lot of long distance swimming. The the mid mile mile was always is always the big one, but there was lots of other ones that would kind of lead up to that as well. And uh, my mom basically sort of came out of retirement to to start swimming again because maybe she she just she wanted to, but also it was a nice way for us to just kind of do things together. And she, yeah, she started, to, she was like, okay, cool. I'm going to do the mid mile mile. I'm like, okay, cool. And I think, I don't know, I was like 13 or 14 or whatever. And I was like, I'm going to whoop my mom's ass. Like, you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, but it was a complete opposite, basically. <laughs> Not that you swim together because they, you know, it's such a big race. There's things like the yeah. biggest swimming race in the world, actually. And 
Uh, wow. So you go, you, you swim in your different age categories. So they, they generally have like the, the, the young girls, the under thirteens, and then they have like the, the older people, like older ladies, like 40, and then they'll swim together. And then you'll have other age group categories swim together. Um, and then wow. separate men and women. Anyway, like I remember she, I was like, I'm going to like just nail her. But anyway, yeah. she came like sixth, I think in her wow. age category and I, and like destroyed my time as well. And I was like, wow, wow. <laughs> you know, but, amazing. And, but I was just so proud. I was like, wow, check my mom. Like she just, you know, she just came That's cool, man. six in mid mama. Like I literally, I was like running around telling all my mates. I was like, my mom can't wow. sit there. <laughs> you know what I mean, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, she, she inspired me for, for lots of different reasons and she supported me like nobody else as well when it came to sporting events and things like that. Like I remember she was always there. She mm. was guaranteed my mom would be there having my back. She would take me to all the trainings, like swimming trainings and all these sort of things. And, you know, I think that's, that, that, is, that is like etched in me around like the importance of doing that, you know, having the people that are close to you having their back and supporting them and being there for them and yeah putting in the time and effort that it requires to build a relationship and mm -hmm. my dad but he's carried on inspiring me my whole life you know and and as a youngster like I always remember he he was a huge runner but like an epic runner um long distance and I remember mm -hmm. him telling me you know about all the training that him and his mates used to do uh, they used to do like run the comrades and uh, he used to tell me how fit he was and the times he was doing. I think he did comrades in seven seventeen, which is just yes. incredible time, wow, like man. silver medal um, mm. sort of stuff. And wow. so that's, I mean, even if you, you break that down into two marathons, that's just ridiculous sort of yeah. <laughs> speed. Uh, so I was always just so inspired by that. And I even remember like he used to take me on runs and stuff would go with um, he, I always used to go, oh, now that I, now I'm talking about it, we used, he used to run for this uh, running club called Kudus. And <laughs> um, I, I used to love going to the running uh, events that have them on Sundays and stuff. And, and you, I would go and I'd like hang out at the, the water stations and hand out the, uh, the water and the Coke to all the runners who are coming past. And yeah, now that I think I used to probably drink more Coke than, than I'd give to the runners, but <laughs> um, <laughs> That was like my perk for helping out. And yeah, my dad's just, he's just such a super smart guy as well. Both my folks are super smart and somewhere along the line, I didn't get that, but uh, they always <laughs> Sorry, used to listen to I know. <laughs> they just, uh, they're just like, you know, always like sort of pushed themselves like to become better, to carry on learning. Like my dad's, you know, he did his MBA when he was super young and, and since then he's, you know, he's carried on learning and he's got uh, law degrees and, and math degrees and state agent things and like just continually learning. And, and I think that that is just now part of my DNA too. I feel like, you know, that's one thing that I keep on doing is just wanting to learn. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I, I'm super grateful, but uh, you know what I mean? Like looking back and, and going through this process, I've, I feel so fortunate, like really fortunate, you know, um, that yeah, I just have such inspiring parents. Yes, man, that's a it's a real pleasure to hear you talk about them, and, and they just sound like such amazing people. And and you know, obviously, uh, we all have to consider ourselves really lucky to to have had that kind of a experience with our folks. Eh? So so that's awesome to hear, man. But while we're talking about inspirational people, um, one of the the last time you actually saw your your granddad was sort of a rather special and a bit of a formative moment for you, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, but um, I remember this trip and I, when I was writing about it, I think it was like, um, yeah, I don't, know, I don't know how many years ago, but I, before I went on this trip, I think it was around the world trip or I was just going back to South Africa and I was like, I really want to go and try like mend, not mend, but just like um, get to know people better and, and, and sort out some, some relationships that I never really had a chance to when I was young. And, you know, the one, the one was with my granddad because I don't know, I never really knew the Oak, to be honest with you. I didn't really know him at all. And, uh, one afternoon I decided uh, it was like one of my last days in South Africa. 
and I had like a free afternoon. You know what it's like when you go home, it's always just like rammed. You just got tons of people to catch up with, which is awesome. <laughs> I just love it, you know. Um, <laughs> everyone just wants to see you and host totally. you and, and feed you and all these things. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's actually really epic that, that people want to do that. So, but I had a free afternoon on a, on a Monday and I said to my mom, oh, I'm just going to go over to Granddad just to tell Hazard quickly. And I'll be an hour and then I'll see you. Cause I, cause I always used to use my mom's car. She always used to lend me yeah. a car. I was like, <laughs> I was like, yes, yeah, she was so, so kind there. Um, <laughs> and I was like, cool, I'll be an hour. And then, you know, you can have the car back or whatever. Not that I think she was going to use it, but anyway. And then, <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I went and I spent time with my granddad and, um, would have our cup of tea and, and biscuits. I used to love going there cause he always had biscuits, <laughs> like, like chocolate <laughs> ones and stuff. And <laughs> it was probably the, the main reason that I went on that day. And <laughs> uh, no, I'm joking. But, um, <laughs> and then we had the most epic afternoon. I was, I spent six hours with him and wow, but... he just took me through, he took me through all these amazing stories, like about the world war and what it was like after world war and what they did. Mm. And then, you know, how he came to South Africa on the ship and how he came with my granny and yeah, it was just, it was just so fascinating. And then he started showing me all his photos and then his stamp collection. And I was just like, wow. I was like, wow. And it was actually the last time I saw my granddad and it was interesting um, saying goodbye to him. Like he was never, I never remember him being too, too much of an emotional guy. Like he just, he was not, I mean, he always, he was always like hugged us and stuff like that. But, you know, I guess you don't really see that side if you don't spend a lot of time with people. And when I say goodbye to him, like we gave each other like a big hug and, mm -hmm. and he actually said, he's like, I love you Gareth. And I was like, wow, I love you wow. too, granddad. Thanks man. And he almost had like a tear in his eye. And then I just like, <laughs> drove off and I was like, cool, man. See you later. See you later, buddy. Uh, see you later, granddad. And, um, and then it was so cool, bud. Cause after that, um, he, I don't know how old he was. He's like maybe 83 or something. And he, and he had like one of those old school cell phones. I think we all had them. This was back in the day of like the Nokia 3310, right? <laughs> Which was probably the most epic phone ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I still remember like being in London and text messaging him and I, and like, I'd say, Hey granddad, how's it going? You know, That's and so he'd, cool. he'd text me back and I was wow. like, this is so cool. My granddad is like 83 and this is going back, you know, this is before, yeah. um, I guess sort of older people became more techno technologically aware and astute and, uh, yeah. And I was like, just so happy that he would send me these text messages. I kind of wish that you could take screen shots at the time. I would have kept oh, them. That's my <laughs> Yeah. So, so yeah, but actually, yeah, when we were writing this, I was also remembering that that same holiday with my granny actually, but this, so that granddad was on my mom's side. Um, and his wife had died many years before that. And then, on the other side, my dad's side, um, my granny was still alive. Um, and I always, for some reason, got on with her. I know she was a hard lady as from what I, the stories I've heard as a youngster and, and maybe not the kindest and nicest, but <laughs> for some reason, because I, I don't know, I, I think I had that cheeky side and, and I was able to, for some reason, get away with it and, and give her a little bit of grief. And she liked me for that reason. And this, that same trip, I went to go see her. I rocked up at her house, like, and, un, un, you know, um, I hadn't basically booked in anything or you know, unannounced basically. And yeah. And I was like, Hey, and then I remember, I remember ringing her bell and then she wasn't actually there. And I was like, gutted. Mm. And then I, and then I just walked back down the stairs to, to the car. And, mm. but then, then like, as I was walking, she, she shouted from the balcony, like she would always do. She would always wait for us at the balcony when she knew we were coming. And then she, and then, and then she like, cause she must've been asleep or something. I don't know. And yeah. she came and then she was on the balcony. She's like, and I, I turned around. I was like, Hey, Hey granny, is it okay if I, if I come And She's like, yeah, yeah, cool. And then we also, we had a cool afternoon and I think it was cricket on. And for some reason she liked cricket a lot. And we watched <laughs> a bit of cricket and also had some tea and Vickies and yeah. So it was, it was cool. And I, that was, I think that was also probably the last time I saw her. So it was those, those, those uh, visits were meant to happen. Wow. Yeah. How amazing is that? I'm so glad that you got to, got to see them. And 
it just shows you, I mean, obviously with older people, you, you, you just, when, you, when you're that age, you just never know, but you just got to cherish all the moments we have with, with the special people and, and make that effort because it's not always easy to make time or people don't make the effort, but well done for doing that, man. And uh, it made all the difference now in, your, in the way you see them as well, you know. And um, just moving on and, and thinking about back to um, high school, uh, you had some ups and downs and what have you, like I'm sure everyone does. But sport was always like a really positive influence in your life in one way or another. And not only sports, but also people. And there were two teachers in particular who were also um, particularly influential in your, in your schooling career and your life. Hey. Yeah, they were Craig and uh, yeah, I was so fortunate. I don't know. I just, I just have such fond memories of school, like for so many different reasons. I don't know. It was just, for me, it was the most epic, one of the most epic times of my life. And I, I don't know why, but I just loved everything about it. You know, I was literally some, some days I would be at school at like 5.30, whatever time we started swimming training. And I would leave school at 11 o'clock at night. No joke. Like, because it was just doing so much stuff. It was crazy. Wow. And, and it, that wasn't just like, that was like for whole terms and things like that. But there was, there was two teachers. I mean, there was lots of, there was actually lots of teachers that stood out. And I just, now that I'm thinking about it more and more. Um, but, but the, the main one that had the, the biggest influence on my life and is still like, you know, an absolute rock and best bud and everything to this day is, um, is Mr. Fox. And I have to call him Mr. Fox because otherwise he gets upset. <laughs> but, uh, obviously it's Sean and we've had, we've had him on the, on the podcast as well. And he just took me under his wing and he just helped me so much in so many parts of, uh, of my, my, my schooling career. And he was just such a big influence. He was basically my, my water polo coach, uh, from when I was in standard six um, and coached me in, in various different ways. Like we had a bit of a break in, in for a couple of those years um, because he just taught different um, water polo teams and age groups. Uh, but he was huge, like really helped me out so much. And, and actually like I, I started working for him after I finished high school, uh, he ran a travel agency and I started um, <laughs> delivering the airplane tickets and things for his clients um, wow. for like the few months before I came overseas. And then ever since then, you know, we've literally caught up every single year, minimum every single year, once a year, uh, somewhere overseas or somewhere in South Africa. <laughs> And just, yeah, he's just been a, a, like a guiding light in my life. And, and, and I'm just so fortunate to have had such an amazing mentor in him. And there was another guy, and I know uh, Mr. Fuchs is going <laughs> to, he's going to roll his eyes or, or not like me saying this, but there was another guy, his name was Mr. Kiddo. And he, he was also my water polo coach um, for, uh, for a couple of years. And he was a he was a tough bastard this guy like really wow. tough um but for some reason he took a liking to me um and he, and he treated me like a son he was quite a lot older right he he, has, he actually used to be a school inspector um so he was he was you know proper old school south african oak like really strict and yes you could this oak i mean not, he never taught me any like class he was a history teacher and guidance teacher i think but you could hear him screaming throughout the whole school when he got mad he was like really mad and and yeah but but for me i was just lucky i just got to see the the, the, the nice kind side of him um i remember not only was he my water polo coach, but <laughs> my mates and I, we used to do everything at school. Seriously, whatever we could do, we just, we just could do. Maybe we were running away from something or whatever, but um, we used to do backstage, right? Like this is ridiculous now that I think of it, but it was such, it was so cool. So, you know, every year the school would put on plays and um, we used to come, like, so you'd have school plays, but then also schools used to compete against each other, mm. like for plays. I forget what it was called now, but you'd actually go to like the Joburg theater and like schools mm. would do short plays against each other. So we used to do the um, backstage for the school plays and for these other ones. <laughs> and honestly, we would spend hours but so so literally like i said it was this, the school plays mainly happened in the winter like seasons um so 
that was the same time we would play rugby. So basically we would go to school, we'd have a full day of school, then you'd finish and then you'd, you'd go to rugby training and you have like two hours of rugby training and probably finish at about like 4.30 or 5. And then after that, we would go to backstage and we'd be building the sets and everything like that. Yes. And Mr. Kid, I remember every single night he used to buy us all. There was like five or six of us Oaks and he would buy us all steers and chips oh, cool. and like Coke and stuff. Like it's like, these are burgers, you know, you know. <laughs> and that was literally every night. And I was, I was just like, I was like, this guy's so cool. And actually even in like when we were in matric and stuff, he, he would allow us to have beers. He would, he would wow. buy a couple of beers and we would, would be there like late at school, like literally would finish at like 11, you know, and wow. uh, would have our steers and a couple of beers and just, I don't know. We just, we made stuff and we talked and we just, I don't know. It was just good memories. You know what I mean? And yeah. And then, but there's so many cool teachers. There was one teacher in particular as well. Sorry for carrying on a little bit. Um, Mrs. Ed. And she was my maths teacher and she was so cool. But I remember when I had, I had my motorbike accidents and she, this lady was just absolutely incredible. She would make food for the family and give it to my mom to, to help me. And she would pick me up and take me home uh, from, from home to school um, because my mom couldn't be there. And she taught me cause I'm, I missed a whole season of a whole season, a whole term of school basically. But she through whole, the whole school holidays for free from what I can remember. Uh, she taught me maths to catch up and stuff like that. And wow. yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't know. I think, I don't know. School in South Africa for me, I think is different or at least it was back then. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure it's kind of still the same now, but you form it's special in South Africa. You form like good relationships with your teachers. I don't know. I think it's also a South African thing. And, um, you know, I'm sure there's a thousand kids, a million kids like me that have these sort of stories. Um, we're just, we're just fortunate to have, have these type of relationships with, uh, with teachers in South Africa. I mean, I totally agree with you. And, but it also, it also is testament to your um, willingness to get involved, get stuck in and, and show up, you know, and, and that's clearly a trait that you've had for a long time. And I think it's always a two way street, isn't it? But we are lucky. And I think people are willing to, to allow, you know, allow you into that inner circle, which is special, especially with, like you were saying with that, Mr. Kiddo, you know, like must have been felt pretty privileged to be in that space with him. But how, how important are, or is having a role model and mentors in your opinion? I think it's huge. I think, I, yeah, I just think it's massive and, and not, not that you know it at the time when you're younger, um, but you do have people that are going to really shape your future and see the good in you and want to help you out. And I, I think for me, I know for me in particular, like if I look back on my life, I've had so many good mentors um, and I don't know if it's because for some reason I was seeking them and that we found each other somehow, but I just feel super fortunate that I've had it. But, but also what I've become conscious of is a, as an older adult now is to carry on seeking these people, uh, because it doesn't matter what level you are at in your life. If you're the president of a country or whatever, there's always going to be somebody who inspires you and who you look up to. And it's important to follow these people because they're going to, they're going to do things that you're going to want to do and push you. And, and, you know, they might be just role models. And so, so basically you just look up to them and don't necessarily have like a direct relationship with them. But then from the mentor side of things, I think it's important to actually go and seek these people and ask them. I even, I even remember like quite a few times um, in my, my banking career and um, also like on, from a social side of things, I, I've actually asked people if they would mentor me. I'm like, you know, do you mind mentoring me? Because I really like, I really connect with you and um, I know that you'll be able to teach me sort of things. And every single person generally says yes. And I think it's, it's a human thing. Like humans 
no matter what you might see in the news and all these sort of things, we we actually really are wired to help each other. Mm-hmm. And, and that's actually what we are about. Like, you know, people love to help each other out. And, um, and if you ask somebody to, to mentor you and to guide you, I can promise you that probably 95% of the time they'll go, yeah, yes, of course I'd, I'd be proud to, I'd, I'd love mm-hmm. to help you out. Um, and yeah, I, but I, but you have to also as, as the person who, who, who needs it or who's seeking it, you have to, you have to have your eyes open and you have to be conscious and, and look for these things too. Um, you know, if you want to grow in life, uh, you, the only way, not the only way, but one of the ways you're going to grow is by seeking and keeping your eyes open and by watching what other people do and learning from them either directly or just sort of indirectly. So, so I'm huge, bud. Yeah. Awesome. And I totally agree with you on that. And, uh, and you've, you know, you are now in a sort of a role where you can mentor others and help others, which is cool. And you've been helped. So it's a, it's a nice way to give back and keep the circle sort of going, isn't it? But, uh, just on a bit of a lighter note, you, <laughs> you weren't always a goody two shoes at school. And, um, and like many South Africans at the time, you received a few jacks and I, and I kind of just had a good laugh when I was reading your <laughs> storyboard about this. And I, I just think it's an interesting thing that, that we took for granted, but a lot of people listening to this won't know what that is. And uh, so can you maybe just explain for listeners what a jack is and why did, would you someone get a jack? <laughs> <laughs> so jack is basically, I don't know. So, so teachers have these depends on which teacher as well. So they'll have generally like a stick type object <laughs> and they'll hit you in different ways. Like, I mean, I think, or some of them might have rulers. So, so the ruler one is a bad one. So the, you, they'll take a ruler and they'll, you'll, you'll put your uh, hands or fingers on a desk and then they'll like slap you with the, the thin side of the ruler on your fingers and like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but then a jack is, uh, yeah, like I said, some sort of stick type object and they'll generally get you to bend over and they'll hit you on the bum. And this is just, this is just what happened in South Africa, you know, like it was almost like a cool thing to get jacked, <laughs> um, which is, which is kind of weird. And I, I got, I got jacked a lot in my life, definitely at arts, <laughs> primary school and, and high school. And, um, yes, I can even remember probably the teacher's names that jacked me. Um, <laughs> Mr. Jubair, Mr. Anton, <laughs> Mr. Fuchs, Mr. Nielsen, all these, <laughs> all these oaks. There was, there was a few others, but, uh, anyway, so, but yeah, I remember that one time was, um, we were on a school trip. This was in standard four or standard five. And we were in Natal and like, we had this amazing trip. We went to go find out about the, the Boer war and the Zulus and all these things. And, for some reason there was like five of us that thought we were kind of the main manner, but we weren't really, <laughs> we were just little ignorant, naughty little boys. <laughs> and we were in this sort of, uh, like public toilets. Um, and in this place, I think it was called Mount Majoji where they had one of the, one of the wars. Right. Mm-hmm. And we decided it would be a good idea to punch a hole, to punch holes in the, the bathroom door, um, oh, wow. to, into one of the cubicles. And, I don't know why we, why we vandalize. It's just so stupid when you look back, you know, um, but Mr. Jubair, he found out him and Mr. Anderson oh. actually, yeah, yeah. And, uh, they were having none of it. So literally yes. they took us straight back to the bathrooms, um, and just gave us hell of a hiding. Like, I don't know, like two or three jacks with like, I don't know what it was that he had found or he had with, he always had a, he always had a, a like a stick or a jack on him. And, um, and yes, we, it was sore and we came running out of these bathrooms and yes. literally our whole standard was like out there, like surrounding it. And, um, you know, <laughs> that you would come out and kind of half of you was kind of like, you know, proud because you were like yeah. people checking you. But then actually deep down now I'm like, oh, I was just super embarrassed, you know, that you'd yeah. actually done that. Cause you thought it was cool, but actually half the people thought, oh, he's such a moron, you know, <laughs> we're doing yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I don't know, but it was just a big thing in South Africa. Guys got jacked for doing so many different things. I remember one teacher used to have a, a cut off hockey stick and, oh. um, 
yo, this was like an accounting class and he would, he would get you and he would jack you with a hockey stick. Um, <laughs> some teachers were really bad. They would get you to put a book in your pants, right? And then they would really hit you hard and you would feel it through the book. Um, yes. But uh, ach, you know what I mean? I, it, it taught me a lot of lessons and um, I, don't, I don't see it as like physical abuse or anything like that whatsoever. I think sometimes a naughty little bugger needs to, <laughs> needs to get jacked just to put him into line because <laughs> it teaches you, it definitely teaches you a lesson quickly not to do stuff again, you know? <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure like anything, people can go too far and, and, and whatever course. you, but uh, I remember also getting jacked and uh, coming home and my, obviously I, I told my brother or someone and, he, and then he told everyone while we were at the dinner table. So then, I, so then I had to pull down my pants at the dinner table with my family and they all had a flip and laugh at my bum because it had like these lines from the jacks. <laughs> no ways, yes. <laughs> so jog, jog the memory for me, oh man. It's so, so it was funny. But um, yeah, crazy how, crazy how that's changed and that's obviously illegal now. Um, but funny, it was funny for us, as, <laughs> the, the, the chats we've had about it. But so still talking about high school, um, actually sort of midway through you, something actually quite terrible happened to you and it's... Um, yeah, it's quite tough to talk about for me just to think about it even and, and obviously for you, but you had a serious bike accident and um, maybe you could just tell us what happened, uh, who was involved and, uh, and how that affected you and your life um, looking back on it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, looking back, I think it was like this amazing blessing in disguise, you know, but of course the time it's, it's nothing like that whatsoever. So me and my buddies, we had actually just got motorbikes. So I'd had, motor, uh, had a motorbike for like a, a whole year. Um, and we always used to ride around like we were 16 and you know, we used to use them to get to school and, and all these things. And it was, it was amazing. It was freedom, but I just, I was just <laughs> like, wow, I had this motorbike and I could now kind of do what I wanted and stuff. And, and it's, it's interesting in South Africa, like when you get your learner's license, it's actually just the a theory exam, which is completely the wrong way to do it. It should be like a practical one. So you don't really necessarily learn the rules of the road um, because you're not tested on that. You're just tested on the theory. I mean, you learn the rules, but you don't actually get tested on like how well you drive and, and you know, how to look out for other cars and all these sort of things. Um, so I don't know if that's changed now, but, it, but I think it's a, it's a big reason why maybe there were a lot of guys and girls who used to have a lot of motorbike accidents in high school. Um, but anyway, so I remember, uh, it was during school holidays and we were just, it was like a few days before we were going to go back to school. And my, uh, my best friend, Brandon and I, we were like, we were, um, yeah, we went to the gym and, um, and we always used to gym in the school holiday. Yes, I, we were fit, like, I mean, <laughs> really. And I think the reason why I got, I escaped actually like, um, you know, sort of fairly injury free in some sort, in some way was because I was so fit uh, in the school holiday. This particular school holidays was um, before athletic season. So we were training a lot of like athletics every single day for like two hours during the school holidays, every single morning. And then Oaks would generally come back to my house and we'd play tennis like all afternoon and then we'd go to the gym, um, you know, in the evening, like or late afternoon. And, and this particular afternoon, uh, Brandon and I went to the gym and uh, then we were going to go stay at his house because it, that's what we used to do. We used to stay at each other's houses. It was like the yeah. best thing ever, you know, and it was so cool when you didn't have to stay at your house, you know, and yeah. <laughs> um, yes. you could go to your mate's house and stuff. Although it was also cool having everyone over at your house as well. But anyway, this night we, we both, we went to the gym and we drove back to Brandon's house and um, Brandon, like, yeah, he lived in this place called Chartwell and we always kind of used to see who go like a little bit faster you know like but but never we we weren't we weren't reckless in any sort of way um and we'd always like be within the sort of speed limits and stuff and i remember i don't actually remember any of this though just so you know like i don't have any recollection what's i actually don't i actually don't remember waking up this morning so this whole day is like there's only one incident i remember and that was we saw a friend of ours before we left the the shopping mall where the gym was um and that, that's the only thing I remember like of this day. So this is all based on other people telling me. So 
we drive into Brandon's house and yeah, it was four o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon. And I was going probably at about 60, 70 Ks an hour. And this guy at the top of this hill, he just, he just came and he, he turned in front of me. I mean, it was, it was my right away. He was, um, just so you know, he was completely drunk. So this guy mm. was actually an alcoholic and he was, he was like wow. plastered at 5 PM in the afternoon. And he turned in front of me, um, as I was just going straight and there was no like stop street or whatever. It was just like I was my right away. And then he, he saw me and he hesitated and we had like this head on collision mm. and yeah, I just, I said this guy head on at like 70, 80 Ks an hour. And um, people that were there said that I flew as high as a telephone pole and like 30 right. meters. And the, wow. the bad thing was, is that my helmet came off because it was such a, like a big impact. And wow. yeah. And the only reason I can, I think that I'm still lucky to be here is probably twofold because I was really, really fit. So my body was in good condition, but two cars behind us was, uh, was an off duty fireman, um, or like paramedic. Mm -hmm. And he fortunately in his car, he had, um, he had equipment that, uh, you know, like, a I think a defibrillator and, and a few other things. Um, wow. And whatever that thing is to keep your lungs open, I don't know what it's called, but, um, but yeah, I, I was just. It, if it wasn't for him, there I would I definitely wouldn't be here, and because um, wow, I'd really injured myself badly, like head, um, really bad head injuries, and and Brandon actually rang up my mom. And, and my stepdad answered and, and he's like, Gareth's been in an accident. You should come. And my stepdad was like, Oh, Gareth's been in an accident. It's probably just like fallen off, you know, his bike or something. Yeah. So you go. And, um, and my mom went and, and as soon as she, cause she's a nurse and she's, you know, she's kind of used to a lot of this sort of stuff. And she basically, she thought I was a goner. She, she she's was like, hard. he's going to die. And she, you know, I'm a bit emotional talking about it, but she like, yeah. um, yeah, she just stayed with me there for like that. I don't know how long it was. Like it was like 30 minutes or something before the ambulances arrived. And then, um, <clears throat> yeah. And then she, and then I got in the ambulance and they took me to Sanson clinic. And, um, I think I was there for three weeks and I was in like a coma, uh, for the first, the first night, um, at least. Um, and yeah, the, uh, uh, that, yeah, I mean, you know, then I was, I was in the hospital for ages. I had, I had short term memory issues big time out cause I had brain swelling and they actually weren't sure if I was going to be brain damaged. Um, and I, I just feel like because I have no memory of this really, you know, like mm. I'm okay, but I feel for everybody else that was there, like Brandon, course, I mean, right. wow. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't so know what, tough, you know what I mean? Like my, yeah. my mom, um, sure. everybody else. And I feel so sorry for them, you know, like what, what they had to go through. Yeah. Um, and yeah, man, it was, a, it was, it was, a, it was, a, I w it wasn't such a bad recovery. I don't think like it probably took a few months, you know, and um, I was just so lucky that my mom, cared for me so much and she took me she basically after three three weeks in the hospital she was like look i'd rather look after him at home and um treat him and she would do that but every single night she would she would change my wounds and take stuff out of my hand because i had mm. had like gravel and glass in my hands and like everywhere like just crazy mm. you know so um so yeah it was i was fortunate i had like I, I did have some bad leg injuries and stuff and I had like, it was quite a bit of my calf cut out um, had really bad nerve damage. And, um, but, but actually I was very, very lucky, I think um, based on what had happened and the speed had happened and everything. I don't know, some angel or something, whatever, just looked after me in that moment, you know, as well as all my friends and family that were there. And then it was just, um, yeah, just, it's to kind of like learn how to walk again properly because the, the, the damage was so bad on my leg. Um, 
but um but I just look back now and um I mean I'm grateful so much for for everyone and everyone that was there and who helped me on so many different levels and I think it was just it gave me it gave me an appreciation for life like literally it's not until something happens to you like that that you realize how precious life is and how quickly it can get taken from you and it's not your choice it's literally not your choice you know like like that 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 drunk oak can, and and it happens to so many people but it happens to so yeah. many people and oh. i was just lucky you know what i mean yeah well but well geez that's a a full-on story my man thanks thanks for sharing that it's uh it's it's must be so tough for for your mom and dad listening to this now to just sort of think about that again and and uh but the people like you said just incredible how people just rallied together even your teachers and mm. your mom and dad and your sis and like mm. so many people like that that you could just probably name sit here naming names for like an hour of all the people that had helped you and and uh it's just amazing how with support how you can get through crazy things like that and and actually you've kind of formulated some some thoughts around like how negative events in our life can kind of um affect us in good ways don't you yeah i think i think we we need to learn from these challenges in our lives like they're there for a reason they're there to um teach us something they're there to make us tougher they're there to help us when it comes to more difficult moments in our lives um to to deal with those moments and they're also there to make us really appreciate and be grateful for what we do have. And I think we need to, we need to treat each moment for, for what it is. Um, if it's good, enjoy that moment. Um, and if it's bad, what can I learn from this moment? And, and why is it happening to me? And, it, it removes that um, victim sort of mentality, um, you know, like, mm. oh, this is happening to me. It's always happens to me, blah, blah. No, that's not, that's not why. It's actually happening to you to, to teach you something about who you are and um, help you just be a better person in the future. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's so many, I don't know, but there's so many reasons why, these, why the negative things happen to us in our life. Um, mm. But we do always need to take a step back and and just sort of do a quick little bit of say analysis or whatever and just go okay i'm I'm aware that this has happened to me um but it's obviously happening for some reason. What can I learn from this process and and yeah, the biggest thing, like I said, with my accident, for example, is that it just makes you feel grateful right? And it makes you feel grateful for what you do have to appreciate the good times more than ever. Um, yeah, that's probably the biggest one. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Man. That's such good advice. And just moving forward a little bit, you've always been a, a man with a adventure close to your heart. And after a rugby tour in the UK, when you're in matric, you, you decided, you know, you're going to take a gap year, only one year to the UK. And, uh, how was your first year in the UK? It wasn't always a breeze, I'd imagine. Um, but it was, it was so interesting, man. Like once again, it, I just remember like it being good times, but it was challenging as well. So yeah, I literally, it's quite funny. I still remember the day it happened. Like I was, uh, I was almost quite disorganized. I, I had packed my bag and I had way too much luggage, but like way <laughs> too much. But I remember putting my bags in the boots of of my stepdad's car and I was, and he's like, and he was always like on the time, like he was always like, come on, you're late, you're late. <laughs> and, um, and then I was like, Oh my, Oh my word. I haven't packed any jerseys. <laughs> and, and I was going to England like March and I was like, Oh, how am I going to put these things in? But anyway, there was, and then I got to the airport and I was, remember I was super emotional. I was like, I was like, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing it? Like, you know what I mean? You're like, mm. I literally just turned 18. I was two months into being 18. And 
and I didn't know. I was like, I was like, then I saw, you know, my, my dad was there, my buddies were there, my, um, my mom, my stepdad, and obviously my stepmom and stuff. And I was like, I just was crying the whole time and I didn't know why I was doing this. <laughs> and the first three weeks were, I think the first three weeks were tough. Like, you know, you, you stay, I was pretty much staying with people I didn't really know, although they were like family and friends and super nice. And it was, um, but it was kind of lonely in a way as well. You know, I was like this little 18 year old guy and I just, just didn't know anyone in London. Um, so, so yeah, but, but actually, I mean, once again, it was, it was there to teach me something, I guess, you know, to probably appreciate what I did have in South Africa and, um, and yeah, but anyway, the, the year moved on, but, and it was, it was, a, it was a cool year. Like I moved in eventually with these Aussie Oaks and, um, I remember, but the, the day I moved in, it was into this like little house. Um, and I, I, I think I shared a bedroom with two Oaks, <laughs> these two Aussie guys, Waza and Heath. And Waza, Waza actually, he ended up, I didn't write about him in the storyboard and I should have, and he ended up being a big, uh, big influence in my life and like literally a big brother, you know? And if I look back now, he was only 28, but to me, he was like, he was like, I don't know, 48 because he was just this <laughs> big, wise bloke in my mind, you know, and, and he literally, he literally treated me like a little brother and, and looked after me and took me under his wing in London. And, um, that night we went to that night that I moved into that house, they, they were like, Hey Gareth, we, um, we're going to go play Aussie rules. I'm like, no ways. I'm like, I love Aussie rules. Like, cause I used to on Friday nights in South Africa, I watch it on Gillette world sports special. They always <laughs> yeah. used to start with Aussie rules. Remember. <laughs> you remember? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and that it was, it was amazing. So like I went to Aussie rules training that night and instantly you had like 80 buddies. It was, I was incredible. <laughs> like there was 80 Oaks of training and, and it was like, that ended up being a huge part of my life, like Aussie rules and stuff. And yeah, man, that first year was cool. I, I, I had three months in London. Then I went to America for four months and I worked in a summer camp and then I traveled afterwards as well. And that was, that was huge for me. Cause like I got to travel for the first time and I was like, wow, this world is just amazing. There's so much cool stuff out there. I and mean, there were so many cool people. And then I went back to London again afterwards and I'd kept in touch with Waza and it was like literally, that was literally when we just started using email, but I remember it's like, <laughs> um, you know, you'd get, you'd get online and you'd still pay like four pounds for an hour of like going online. You know what I mean? It was crazy, but, and, and yeah, I kept in touch with him and email whenever I could. And then I moved back to London and he's like, cool, I've moved into a new house. Uh, we've got a room for you, uh, you, but you're sharing with me. And, um, and yeah, and I moved in and, and that was also like a big formative part wow. of, of me. Like I moved in this house, there was like 14 of us or something crazy, but, uh, just <laughs> such cool oaks, like guys and girls, Kiwi boys who ended up becoming just best mates and was of course, and other people. And I still remember like they were just such a big part of big influence and they, we had so much fun. Like I can't, I mean, it was just <laughs> nonstop fun. Seriously. Like they, they were just crazy cool people. And, um, and I remember them saying to me like, Gareth, like why, why are you going to go home? Because I was only going to be there for a year. They're like, why are you going to go home and, and what you're going to go study? Like, why don't you just stay for another year? Um, and I was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Why don't you stay for another year? <laughs> you know, like to me, it didn't seem like a big deal. I, I had enrolled. I was actually enrolled to go to, to go to UCT, I think, uh, to study, to be a physio. Cause that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> and, um, and I remember ringing my mom the week before, cause I was meant to fly home on Christmas Eve or on Christmas day even. And I rang like on the 18th or something. I was like, Hey ma, how's it going? Um, she's like, Hey my boy. She's like, I can't wait to see you. And I'm like, yeah, um, about that. <laughs> um, uh, I think I'm going to stay for a bit longer. <laughs> oh, and uh, I can imagine she must have been quite devastated and sad and stuff. And I just ended up staying, but then I, you know, I did eventually go home after like a couple of years. And um, that was the first time I went home, actually. So, yeah, there's <laughs> first year in London was good on so many different levels. Um, awesome. and, uh, yeah. 
And 20 years later, you're still there. Yeah, <laughs> no, can you believe it, man? 20 years later. But you mentioned that, um, you know, the sport, and, and you, you were a very sporty guy right the way through triathlon. Swimming was a massive part, as you rules, rugby. What is, like, how do you see the role of sport in your life and in, in life in general? For me, it's been, like, it's been a defining thing in my life. It's literally helped me get through life I think you know what I mean like I just everything around me has like gravitated you know to doing some form of activity and I think it's helped, like it's definitely that's where I would say probably 90% of my friendships have come from is, is through playing sports and um, it's obviously taught me to really know or it's taught me to appreciate my health that's for sure it's taught me to learn a lot about my health and the importance of being healthy um and also the value of like good competition like healthy competition i think that's an important thing in life and yeah it's just been amazing like on you know from a social perspective to get to understand who i am to how to interact with people to how to treat people and it's to this day like I think it's just such an important thing for everybody to do um, is to to find some sort of sports which you like and uh, to to carry on doing that. It's important. Community is so huge in our lives, you know, and especially the older we get, because I think the older we get, almost the more recluse we get as well. Um, mm. And we actually have to be very conscious of that. And, and not go that way because when you do start isolating yourself, you start, I don't know, you start dying slowly inside, I feel. And, and that's why community is so huge. And for me, sports has been that. It could be, there's so many other things that can do that for you now as well. But sure. I think sports is good because of the competition. It's healthy. Um, socializing, you get to meet different people. You get to learn a lot about yourself. And it's always going to be a huge part of my life. And um, yeah, that's why it's been good for me. It's awesome, man. And uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with you. It's just a community with the added bonus of being healthy and thinking in that way, except a lot of sports you end up having a few fines musings afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so you're not uh, called the token big fella for, for nothing. Uh, why did you get into bodybuilding and, and what has it taught you? Well, wow, Craig, so my whole life, uh, my mom used to talk about uh, this guy, um, John John. And John John was a guy that she used to swim with. Okay, They were like, they were serious swimmers. I mean, if it wasn't for... If it wasn't for South Africa being apartheid, my mom would have been a Springbok swimmer and probably swam at the Olympics and stuff, you know. And John John actually, even though he grew up in South Africa, he had a British passport and he swam at the Olympics in, in the UK. Wow. Um, but anyway, John John's dad was Reg Park. Now, if you don't know Reg Park, he's like the sort of man when it comes to bodybuilding. He won Mr. Universe three times and he was actually the hero of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger based himself on Reg Park. Okay, so mm -hmm. my mom always used to talk about this Oak Reg Park and, you know, him, and I never ever met him or got to see him, but she'd talk about Reg and John John, blah, blah. And so it was always something that was just, you know, in, inside my mind somewhere. And, and we also trained gym, but literally from, I remember, I think from like when I was 16, 15, 16, we were in the gym as youngsters and, you know, trying out weights and whatnot. And, and literally mm. that, that has been my whole life. And I remember at one point, I think it was like around about 2012, 2013, I, was, I, I started becoming really interested in, in mindset and nutrition and, and wanting to just push myself a little bit in, in, in those various aspects. And I uh, I was like, cool. I'm training. I'm training hard every single day, like in the gym, but I don't actually really have a goal. You know, like, why am I doing this? I might as well. I might as well. You know, use all this training to like uh, to to just better myself. And um, one of the things that I also struggled with at the time 
Craig was actually speaking in front of people. Like I, I used to get so nervous, like speaking in big groups of people and in front of them. And I was like, okay, cool. I want to get healthier. I want to look good. I want to use the time wisely that I'm doing. And, um, how can I, how can I use something that I'm doing now positively and whatever? So I decided to enter into bodybuilding, um, competition and the, the first person I went to was John John because he, that's what he did. Like he, you know, he was like, he is an encyclopedia when it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to training and weights and bodybuilding and stuff. And he was my first coach. And I just still remember like the, the coaching and stuff that he gave me and the, the training program and stuff. And it was just incredible. And I'd actually met, I actually had only met John John for the first time in real life in California. I went to go meet him, um, you know, on, on one of my trips and uh, it was just, just amazing. Like listening to him and he showed me all these photos that he took me into his office in his gym wow, man. and there That's was amazing. photos with him and Arnold Schwarzenegger um, as a youngster when Arnie used to come to South Africa and visit his dad Jeez. and train with his dad. And then he showed me like, I don't know, just all these pictures of these amazing bodybuilders, you know, and I was wow. just like kind of mesmerized and yeah. So I got into bodybuilding and I loved it. It was so cool. It, it, it just taught me so much about like, me as a person and and made me appreciate things so much more and um just a huge part of my life like it was like the competing was only probably about three years but it's um yeah like i said it taught me a lot it, it gave me the confidence to be in front of people i uh, i had a newfound respect it taught me so much discipline um it really taught me like what i how far i could push my body uh, things around time management. I don't know just everything. It was, you know, you mm. met a new community of people once again. And yeah, it was, uh, I, I just look back on it fondly. It's like, it's, it's such a, it's such a cool thing to actually do to get out there and get on stage and, you know, um, pull your muscles and <laughs> have yeah. a good time. <laughs> um, so yeah. It was amazing, man. It was, you know, we came to Barnes and I came to watch you the one year where we met Rainy there. And it was just really like proud moment, like so amazing to watch you do that. It was, it gave me a super proud feeling, but also it gave me new respect for how hard, how hard you trained to get those results. And like you said, it's, it's dedication and time management and food. And this is insane actually. So, and it gave me certainly more respect for, for the sport. Um, uh, besides it's not just about bulging muscles. There, there's a lot more to it and another layer that we don't often see until you've got a buddy that's doing it and you see how hard it is actually. And the, the mental game that it is so amazing stuff, bud. So uh, while you were, you know, talking about this time in, in the, in UK, you, you medical trials and beer bottle pack, packing, weren't for you anymore so you you made your way you got into um, investment banking which is, is quite amazing you didn't have a degree so maybe you can just talk a little bit about your filing prowess and <laughs> some of the other positives uh, that you got from your banking days yeah man I just look back on it fondly and it was interesting as soon as as soon as I had made that call to my mom to say I'm gonna stay in the UK I was like okay I need to actually do something with myself if I'm going to, cause up, like up until then, like you said, I'd just done odd jobs, but I was only a youngster. So, um, and then I was the first, uh, the first job I got, cause I was like, I need to get a bit of office experience. So I went and I did telemarketing and I think I did telemarketing for like almost a year or something. It was crazy. Um, <laughs> and then after I had had that on my CV, I was like, okay, cool. I've got a year in an office. Uh, let me go to a job fair. And I went to this job fair in London and I think I was 19, I think so. Yeah. And, um, I, was, I took them my CV and I was like, ah, oh, I really, really want to get into banking. Like I love numbers. Like I had no idea what banking was. To be honest, I had zero clue what it was. <laughs> I was just like, I loved maths at school and I love numbers. And I was like, I want to get into banking. And, and this one lady, I even remember her name was Sandra and she worked at one of the recruitment agencies because recruitment agencies control the market in London. That's like how you get a job in banking. And, yeah. She's like, cool. Uh, and then she rang me, I don't know, like literally that, that same week. She's like, oh, I've got a job for you. And um, 
it's doing the filing at uh, Deutsche Bank. And I'm like, that is amazing. And I mean, <laughs> I think I was earning like five pounds an hour at the telemarketing and she's like, it pays eight pounds an hour. Is that okay? I'm like, Oh my word, that's amazing. <laughs> and, um, and that was it. But I, I literally, for two years, I started doing the filing, the filing. And I was so, I, like, I was so proud. Like, I was like, oh my word. Like, I was having to put on like smartish clothes, even though it was, you know, still like just a <laughs> shirt. And then um, I remember my, my first boss, this guy, Andy, he, he was like, cool. He showed me what I needed to do. I literally had to walk between all these different buildings in the city but i was like wow check the city it's like the financial wow. district you know of london and i had to go and i met all these different guys in all these different apartments and they would give me these different sheets of paper in each different like building that i went to and uh and I still remember walking through the streets and like Andy, like people would walk past him and he'd go, Hey, how's it going? And I'm like, Oh my word, this guy knows everybody, you know? Wow. <laughs> and, um, I was like, wow, that's so cool. And yeah, that's what I had to do. I had to, every single day I had to walk between these buildings and it was awesome. Like I, I kind of had free reign in a way. All I had to do was make sure that I filed them in these A4 lever arch files and I think they gave me a computer, but I, I literally, I didn't have access to anything. I just, I, I just, I just, the only thing I had access to, I think was to actually put these into a system or something to say that I had filed them. Um, but I like, I knew this was my opportunity, right. In, in some sort of way. <laughs> um, I had no idea if I was going to study or not or what the story was. I was just like, cool, I'm in banking. Let me just, let me just do the best job I can. And, and that's what I did. And I think once again, it was such a fun time when I look back on it, like all of us were pretty young in that apartment, like from, from memory. And, uh, we just used to socialize a lot and like smile and joke and whatever, and, and whatever. And then eventually I think, I think it was almost two years later. I remember my boss, this lady, Nicola Cruz, she was really cool. And, or yeah, there was a few of them, but anyway, she, she said, uh, she said, yeah, cool. Would you like to do something else? I'm like, I'd love to, you know, she's like, well, we, mm. you know, we, we'll train you up. And, and Luke, this guy, Luke Oliver, he's still a good friend of mine. And I catch up with him whenever we're in New York and he's like, okay, well, we're going to teach you to do, to do this, you know, to do his job. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And then, cool. um, I still remember doing the training with Luke, like over a few months and it was, it was very basic stuff to be fair, but it was like, for me, it was this huge step up and I had this new found responsibility and, um, yeah. And anyway, so, so I, I, I started taking on this new role and whatnot. And then, um, yeah, it ended up being a 20 year career. Obviously I moved on from Deutsche to a few other different banks and just learned so much about, business about the finance world um about people about dealing with different personalities about stressful situations about mm. what's what real money is in a way you know and also like how much stuff is just how crazy the world is as well um but uh you know like but it gave me so many skills that at the time and i think people that are in the industry now don't necessarily appreciate you know like how to be organized and um, how to deal with stressful situations and how to write good documentations and send good emails and, you know, deal with tough people and uh, yeah, so many different things that you just kind of take for granted um, when you're in it. But actually these things, even though they kind of seem basic, a lot of people don't get that sort of training in, in their own industries, you know, and, and it's, it's actually fundamental to be successful. If you, if you are organized in what you do, that is a great base uh, to, to work from um, because you just actually know kind of what's going on and you're able to plan things and these sort of things. So mm -hmm. banking for me was, was amazing. I, I, I loved it, but I loved it. And, and I, and I, <laughs> I just have so many cool people that I met that um, once again also helped me and shaped me and stuff like that. And I was fortunate to have very great managers. And um, it's weird when I look back at my life, like how lucky I, I am to have had these mentors and 
and people that have helped me and guided me in, in such a great way. And, uh, it's just, it, I just feel super fortunate actually, you know? Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of it, I guess, in, in, in yeah, that's cool, a man. couple of minutes. That's no, awesome. No, it's brilliant. Like, uh, whenever I hear you talking, uh, talk about banking it, uh, yeah, I know you, you still light up a little bit, you know, because you were there for so long. It's, it's just interesting to see, you know, it's still shaped you, as you said, and, uh, and you've got so much knowledge about it. I'm always like really enthralled when I'm listening to you and you talk about banking and you, you've told me so much about this machine, you know, that, that's sometimes very slow moving and archaic, but sometimes at the, the front edge of things, it's just really, really fascinating. So um, I'm sure there's a book in there one day about the banking industry, but um, <laughs> you actually ended up, um, you left banking for a bit, then you went back and then you left permanently ultimately. Um, and what, what sort of made you make the change and move away? And, and off the back of that, did you get a bit of pushback? Oh, interesting. Good question. So uh, I always, I don't know what it was, Craig, even though I loved it, there was always something else inside me. I just didn't feel like this is, was what Gareth had to offer the world. I was like, mm -hmm. you know, even though it taught me so much, um, I just felt like there was, there was a void somewhere in my life and I wasn't providing the value that I, that I thought I, I probably could. And the first, I remember we had worked on this crazy project. Like I've, I've, I've actually probably never really worked that hard in my life. Like it was, it was RBS had just bought, um, AB and Amro. It was the biggest, and I think still is to this day, like the biggest financial merger in, in history. It was like 75 mm -hmm. billion dollars or pounds or something. It was huge. Wow. Right. So the project was long. It was like two, three year project to, to break this bank up into different things and put, put a new whole new bank together and blah, blah, blah. Um, and it kind of wore me out a little bit. Like the hours were incredible. It was really stressful. And, and eventually I said to my boss, this lady, Nicole, also a great lady. And, I said, uh, yeah, I, I really would like to take a sabbatical um, uh, once everything is finished. And she was like, cool, no worries. And um, I, I took a six and a half month sabbatical and it was like, that's when my eyes really got opened and I spent pretty much most of that time in South America. And I met these like amazing people and it's, yeah, it, uh, they were like doing all these cool things around the world, you know, like working from their laptops and, and doing things on the internet and stuff. And I was like, wow, I was like, wow, that's cause I was like, so like in the zone with just banking and stuff. I'd done it for like at that stage, probably, I don't know, 13 years or something like that. And I just thought that was it, you know, like this is the world, the world's all around that. And is, you know, that's where you want to be if you want to be doing cool things is in like say banking but then I met all these other people and then I started seeing more of the world. I'd already done a lot of traveling, you know, up until then, but I started seeing like really cool things and I started remembering that I really loved nature and being outside and I love being around people and meeting people. Like it was for me, that was like such a big part of it. Like it was about seeing all these people and making these new friendships. And I went back to, to banking, like you said. So, so that, that's what got it. That's what it got it going. And I was like, mm -hmm. But I was like, I'm going to go back to banking and now I'm like refreshed and energized and I'm going to hit it and I'm like, you know, going to make a name for myself and blah, blah. And then honestly, two weeks after I was back, I was like, this is not for me. And mm. I just knew it. I just like, I, I need to, I need to get out and do something else. And like you said, there was a, I, I did leave and I left, but I left and I had no plan really, but I just. I kind of thought I was going to do something and I did mm. some studying or like around app development. Cause I thought I was going to get into that cause that was the thing to do. And I just kind of messed around a little bit. And eventually I actually went back into banking for, for another three years. Um, wow. but I went back as a, as a consultant. So it, my setup was a little bit different. I wasn't like a permanent employee, um, so I was able to go to like a few different places and I was able to save a bit more cash than normal. And, but at the same, but then I was like, okay, you have to have a plan. And for those three years I worked on, I worked on what I wanted to do. 
Um, and I thought I, I knew what I was going to do at the end of those three years. Um, but I'd been going on courses and meetups and whatever, and just kind of find reading books and listening to podcasts and all these sort of things. And yeah. And then eventually after those, uh, those three years in it, I was like, okay, I know what I want to do. Or I thought I knew what I wanted to do. And, mm. but I, w- and I, I wasn't enjoying the banking anymore. The, the, the banking had changed a, a fair bit. The industry became, I don't know, it just became weird. It was too regulated in terms of the only projects you were working on were, were, were regulatory, which, um, which were boring, to be honest with you. And also mm. the banking industry was like shrinking and you, you never kind of felt safe in your environment uh, or your, your job was safe. And everyone felt like that. No one was enjoying it. Like it wasn't fun to go into the bank anymore. And I, like, I, I couldn't deal with that because my mindset had shifted. I couldn't deal with, mm. with like going into a place where it, it wasn't a growth mindset. Everybody was like hating it and they wanted to do something else, something else. And, but most of them would never because they just talk about it. Mm. And I knew that I had to make a, a clean break from it so that I could get into a different headspace and go do what I actually wanted to do. And yeah, and that was the kind of start of all of that. That's awesome and well done. It's a it's a fascinating roller coaster and, and it's amazing how when you went back, how you you just knew it just wasn't for you anymore. But it was actually on one of those sabbaticals, if I'm not mistaken, that uh that we actually met and we said last week that you would finish the story off a little bit. And I'd love to hear your take on, on where you were at when we actually met. Yeah, for sure. So Craig, I literally just, I just finished work. I think like I'd, I'd finished my, my, I'd been on probably holiday for two weeks or so in London and, um, the first trip that I took was to Ibiza and I was like, the, 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 the sort of, the world was my oyster. You know what I mean? I didn't really know <laughs> what exactly it was, but the world was certainly my oyster. Well, no, actually, let me, let me, I think that was the first, no, actually I lied. This was the, this was the first time I left actually. That was when yeah. I met you guys. That was the first time I so, but but at the same time, I still thought the world was my oyster. I was like, yeah. cool, I'm free. <laughs> I don't know where this is going, but um, I was just like high, like on energy. You know what I mean? I was yeah. like, cool. This is the start of my trip, and I had like a few things planned after that as well. And yeah, it was so interesting. Like I, I rocked up in Ibiza. I had I had no accommodation booked. I, I was like. I'm just going to be like a bit more carefree in my life. Like for, you know, now that I've left banking and whatnot, I'm just going to see where it goes, you know? And I think that's been a a good part, a good, um, good mindset. And that's helped me a lot actually. And (laughs) so I was like, cool, I'm just going to rock up. And I thought I was going to stay with some colleagues of mine from banking that, um, that were also there. And um, yeah, got to, uh, got to your apartment because I couldn't get hold of these other people <laughs> and uh, just instantly like I was just greeted by this group of like I don't know you just felt familiar to me <laughs> and and it's probably the South African thing as well I I still feel so much more connected to South Africans than and lots of other people uh, just because that's what that's, you know what I mean? We just have these commonalities and it was these, I don't, there was like six or eight of you there and just everyone greeted me with these open arms and like massive hugs and like high fives and big smiles. And I think we had all been drinking already. And I'd also had a couple of drinks on the airplane and stuff. And, <laughs> and it was literally like, I was like, Flip, this is my this is my South African family in Ibiza, you know? <laughs> and and that was it. But we just uh, we literally uh, hit it off from from that first second. And and you have always made a big effort. And this is something I'm I, like I always check. Like you always make a big effort to make people feel comfortable. And like you'll go and you'll talk to them on the side and and whatnot and get to know them. And you know that's what that's what you did with me as well and um 
you know, it was it's just true <laughs> testament to who you are as a person and like why we are, you know, like, like we are now. And, um, Oh, it was just epic, but I just, I, I, I just remember laughing the whole time. Like it was like, we were all lost long buddies, you know, and we just yeah, yeah. We had so much fun. It was incredible. And then we, I think from then we started calling ourselves the wolf pack even. And yeah. <laughs> I even remember like at the end of the trip, we wrote on the wall, like, or, or like on a piece of paper on the wall and we did it. I'm, I've got, forgot, forget what it was, but we had this cool thing and, um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you remember, but anyway, it was it was cool, and, and that's just like always etched in my memory. But oh, but it was like such a fun trip. Like, when did you sleep that night, my man? Yes, I slept <laughs> on. <laughs> that was a crazy night, but I don't know what happened in that nightclub. But like you said, but I was like, I was just going for it. That's for sure. I had my I had my shirt off like probably from the instance we got inside <laughs> and then um I, I couldn't find my shirt that's for sure so i don't know where it was. <laughs> and then i lost everybody and i and and you know rookie mistake like when you go on on a holiday you should remember where you're staying whatever and i had no <laughs> clue i had no clue where we were staying like i literally I don't know how I got back to the, that apartment block. Literally had no idea. And I don't think I know this story. It's classic. <laughs> no, I literally have no idea how, like how I would have even told the taxi driver to get me back. Wow. There. Like I, I, I don't know, but somehow the homing pigeon in me found it. Found, <laughs> but then also I didn't have a key or anything because you Oaks were all still partying and I don't know why I decided to leave and you were all still partying. And I saw, I think I got in through like the, uh, the basement somehow. I don't know what it was, but like I got into the uh, security basement or whatever it was. And um, uh, yeah. And then, and then, but then I didn't know, I, I didn't know what flat number it was or anything whatsoever. So I was literally knocking on like every single door that I could. Uh, <laughs> but but of course it's Ibiza. Everyone's out partying, you know. What I mean? No one's no one's there, and I st I remember being quite cold because I didn't have a flipping shirt on. <laughs> and then I was like, well, I'm cold. I'm drunk. I'm just gonna sleep on the stairs, yeah. And <laughs> someone is gonna see me at Find some you. point. And then and then I like I fell asleep, of course. And then when I woke up, I was like, ah. Oh, and then that was like 7 a.m. or something. And I think you guys had just got back from like a, a sunset on the beach. And, <laughs> and I, I went to the one door and I could hear there was still like a party going on. And I like, I opened the door and then you guys were all there. And you're like, oh, where have you been? Where have, where have you been? And I was so upset because you said you had been to like the beach and you had that cool sunset and you took these cool photos. And I was like, glad yeah. that I wasn't there. I was like, that's what I wanted to, where I wanted to be. Oh, and man. <laughs> uh, I will have to do that again one day. So I can't 100%. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Classic. I loved hearing that story, man. And I think we all ended up wrestling and stuff on the on the couches and stuff. It was yeah, pretty crazy. Funny. Was, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so um, in that time, you were saying how you actually upskilled, you were upskilling yourself um, all this time. Uh, the first time, maybe with less intent, but then the second time with a lot more focus and drive and, and intent. Um, which ultimately led and has led to you becoming an executive coach. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do now and, and why you do what you do? Yeah, for sure. So maybe I'll just give that a little bit of background quickly. So yeah. when I left, I actually felt like a one trick pony. Uh, I, f I felt like I didn't have many skills because I'd just done banking my whole career. So I, I had a plan. I was like, cool, I'm going to go study to upskill myself and to to learn these new things and to get like maybe a couple of certifications and stuff under my belt and i really thought that i was going to go into the the fitness and, and wellness world and and train i don't know do some like sort of high-end personal training and these sort of things and um but i wanted to make it also a little bit different you know i didn't want it just to be weight training and and these sort of things so i went to india and I studied to be a yoga teacher and a meditation teacher. And then I also studied to be a chef, like I did a whole chef's diploma for a whole year and, and a few other things as well. Mm. And I was, I was training a couple of people on the side and I, 
but I don't know. I don't know what it was. Like I, I didn't, I didn't love it. I didn't, I didn't like, I, like I, I love training myself and I do like helping people get fit and, and these things, but I didn't, wasn't loving it. Do you know what I mean? Like I thought I would. Um, and then, like you said, I was upskilling the whole time. I was doing these things. We did the alt MBA, which was amazing. And, and ultimately like, you know, it was one of the reasons that, uh, we got to launch a pod, the podcast, mm. um, and um, also, or not launch. You know, we we launched it for another reason, but it helped us like have a plan for it. So I say, yeah. um, and then the other one. Uh, then I started. Uh, Sean Fuchs actually, he said to me, "Bud, I'm doing this executive coaching thing. Uh, why don't you do it with me?" And mm. I was like, "You know what? I think it's such a great idea because then what I can do." is I can use the science of coaching and I can use it like in the fitness world because I still thought I was going to kind of do that. And I know there's like an art and a science to coaching, right? It's not just mm. about, you know, you do this, you do that, blah, blah. Sure. So, so I was like, yeah, okay, cool. This was awesome. And it was actually the best thing that almost happened to me. Like it was so cool that him and I did it together because throughout yeah. the whole uh, three or four months of it, we got to coach each other week in and week out. And that was really, really, really powerful that it was him and me doing it with each other. And mm. through that process and through doing that uh, certification, I realized actually this is what I really love to do. I love to coach people uh, to bring out the absolute best in them. And I think personal development is a huge thing. Uh, but I think if you have somebody who knows uh, how to bring out the best in you and who has experience in quite a broad uh, variety of things in life that it will help you get to your goal much quicker than if you're doing it by yourself. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so the, the coaching thing like that, that, that through university, through UCT was like just probably the biggest sort of um, trajectory to getting to me where I was now. And I decided, okay, cool. I don't really want to, do the, the, the health and wellness thing that much. Um, I want to really help people in their careers, in their life. And, you know, if they want to set up businesses, we can do that too. Um, and yeah, so I just fell in love with the coaching part of it and it's, yeah. it just felt right, you know, and, yeah. and seeing people come through my program and seeing the changes that they make in their lives, in their mindset. And just in their outlook, you know, like lots of people come not necessarily thinking that there's, there's maybe too much hope or whatever, or, and, and then by the end of it, they're like, wow, okay, cool. I'm, I've got so much to offer this world and now I have a plan and I know how to do it too. I've got a, got a, you know, good toolbox to actually use to take me forward. Um, and it's an amazing process because the, the more I do it, the more I learn about people and the more I improve my, my program at the same time as well. So actually like what my program looked like in the start is going to be nothing what it looks like even in a few months time, because there's so many great things out there that, uh, that I'm learning to add to it. And, um, yeah, it's just been, for me, it's been, it's been nourishing for the soul. Like I feel like it's, I'm in the right place now. Um, so, so yeah. That's okay, awesome, man. And let me tell you that, let me tell you, you've, it's hard to describe how much I've seen you grow and just how much you light up. And when you speak to your, or when you talk about, you know, you've seen X, Y, and Z client and it's just your face beams and you're just super enthusiastic and just hearing some of the changes that some of your clients have had are just um, really inspiring, man. So just keep up the good work. And I'm glad you know, like this whole journey that's so crazy that all these things we've been discussing leads you to this sort of a point in your life. And uh, I just love how that's, how it's all fitted together and, and how these all uh, talking about, you know, just these times in our lives that, that you just meet people. Um, it, it's during this sort of time that I, it's hard to know exactly when, but I start seeing these photos of this pretty girl on, on Facebook. And there was one particular one with these, tights with they were like zebra tights and <laughs> classic on facebook and how, how did you meet this awesome brazilian and uh yeah tell us uh, a little bit about your 
I'm more. <laughs> I'm glad you asked, my man. I'm glad you asked. So it was, <laughs> it was really cool, actually. So when I was tra- I started training for the bodybuilding and stuff like that, and I was training at this awesome gym in London. It was at the time it was called Reebok. It's now called Third Space, and there was this hot, sexy chick that uh, <laughs> worked there, and only ever had a massive smile on her face you know well she was either like super focused because she was like showing people around whatever but she was always like pretty flamboyant you know brazilian whatever like and um, <laughs> but always like very smiley and uh she always used to wear not always but like you know she had these different outfits that she would wear and, and that's why she was definitely the top salesperson there because they were it was either like a a sexy little skirt and she has amazing <laughs> legs and <laughs> all these like really tight leather pants. And I was like, wow, there's leather pants. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, but, uh, but you know, I was, I'm probably trained there for a year and, and maybe said like five, 10 words to her. And, and, but I would always make sure that I just said hello and whatever. Mm. Um, and, but I was like, so the first year I was like, so into my training and stuff, I just was like in the zone. And then yeah, one day I just, like, we became friends on Instagram, actually. I, like, started following <laughs> her on Instagram because I was like, she seems like a cool chick. Let me let me just scope her out a little bit, you know, do a little bit of stalking. <laughs> just to see if she's, like, as nice as she as she seems. And um, she was, she, like, just, well, you know, as much as you can pick up from her Instagram thing, like, yeah. I was just, like, she seems like a very cool, nice, like, down-to-earth um, lady. And... Uh, she had just come back from Brazil and I, uh, I messaged her and I had, I had two, I always, but I love like uh, music uh, concerts and stuff like that. And I always used to like, or I still do like always used to um, get like notifications of when they were coming up and things like that. Yeah. Even if they were a year in advance, or that was like cool. And <laughs> I would always buy two tickets um, because I was like, okay, um, I can, inv- I can invite a friend or if I'm seeing somebody, I can, someone will come, you know what I mean? I was like, yeah. I always just used to like bring mates to these things. And, and I had two tickets to Queen actually, um, that they had reformed and, uh, what's his name? Adam, Adam Lambert, I think is, was the lead singer. And I love Queen. I mean, I grew up with Queen as well. And little did I know, <laughs> like Marissa had as well. And I was oh, like, cool. I messaged her on this. I was like, Hey, I've got two tickets to Queen. Would you like to come? And she, I think she thought about it for a bit because she was like, mm, okay, who's this oak? <laughs> in a way, like, because like, um, they always used to joke about me in the, in the like, offices, of the gym, I think. And then she said, yeah. And, uh, and that was it. Cool. Like, we, we went and we had a great time at the Queen concerts and um, just danced and sang and, and laughed with each other. Cool. And yeah, then we caught it for a little bit after that. And yeah, everything is. Uh, history now so <laughs> been together just over four years and and lived together and it's it's a really nice easy fun relationship which is cool and she's she still beats your cards though so that's uh <laughs> yeah, but she's a cheat bud she's a cheat at cards. Uh, <laughs> but she's let me just say a little bit about marisha she's um just one of the most smiley people i've met just always got a positive spin on on life and on things and and she's doing so well. She's got a little business growing and she's, she's working at the same time. And, and I just love seeing how much fun you guys have together. And, uh, and actually soon you'll be designing and building a little house together. Uh, can you just quickly tell us a, bit, a little bit about that maybe? Yeah, for sure. So even though like I've been in London such a long time, um, we still feel like we there's something there that's 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 missing and it's i think it's growing up in south africa and enjoying the outdoors and these sort of things we're like we, we want like a outdoor lifestyle and and better weather overall you know like more sun and these sort of things so mm-hmm. we bought a piece of land in portugal and um we're planning to build a house together in portugal and yeah we've been speaking to uh, architects recently and um getting really 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 excited about that um marissa absolutely loved design and renovations and and all these things and um you know i'm super happy that that i have her to to help because she's just got such an eye uh, for these Mm. things so so yeah we're really really excited but we we ideally would have liked to have been there ready uh but hopefully 
by this time next year, we'll be, we would have been living there for a few months already and our building will be on the way to, you know, to maybe not, not, not quite complete, but like it'll have a few, few months still to go and we'll be living life in a better climate, more outdoors and, uh, building our future together seriously you know it's epic man and some i see some great veggie gardens and all sorts of amazing things for and i expect an, an amazing podcast room when i come and visit so well, uh, epic times <laughs> you know that but you know, one of it is like one of the the reasons is to build like an epic podcast studio for, <laughs> for us. And then you're going to have like your own separate quarters where you can stay for as long oh, as you awesome. want. And uh, that's the plan, but it's uh, this Suck is, it, Joe Rogan. This is, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is just the start, but this is our podcast in the bedrooms, but we it changed <laughs> uh, every minute. It's so excited for you guys. Seriously. It's, it's just one of the most, it just seems right. And it's, the time's right. And I'm yeah, super excited for you guys. So we just, we're sort of winding down here and, um, but I do want to ask you just one or two more things. Um, it's, it's been around two years since you've, or around two years since you've left banking now, maybe a little longer. And I've just seen such amazing changes in you seriously. And, um, on so many levels, you've, I've seen a softer side of you emerge. You, um, you've got incredible dedication and work ethic for someone who's, you know, working from home and, and becoming an amazing coach uh, like and i don't just say that that's just you know that, that's coming from a real honest place uh, and helping others fulfill their dreams you know that's just what an amazing purpose but what have been some of your realizations over these last two years hmm. good question but so the big realizations for me have been um that one, I'm getting older and that it's now a very important time to start really contributing back into the world and to start making a difference. Like I feel that I enjoyed a great time when I did my banking and um, learned a hell of a lot, but it was kind of one way in a way, you know, you're just mm. adding to the, the world economy or whatever big banks sort of uh, bottom line. And that's, that is, that was, that was, that was a good period for then, but now I need to start giving back to the world and providing value. And that is like my ultimate goal to, to make the world a better place for people to actually see the truth to, for people to see the good in themselves and to realize that, every single person has something to offer and that that has probably been the most important thing um i'm trying to remember the exact way you worded the question again sorry can you just say it again but yeah yeah so so i would just basically what are some of the realizations that you've had just about you know having the space to think and not being in the corporate environment i, I could just imagine giving you a lot of like reflection on different things and, and what you've just mentioned is a, is a real powerful one, but maybe there's other stuff that you've realized maybe about yourself or just life uh, since you've been doing your own thing for two years solid. Yeah. So there's so much, there's so many layers to life and we really need to appreciate a lot of the small things. I think mm. for me, relationships are just huge, you know, and you need to go deep on your relationships. I, I, I look back fondly with, you know, the people I've met in my life, but like, I, I really want to get to actually know them better. I want to be more compassionate and, and understand their stories um, and really um, be conscious of why they are in my life. And uh, to, yeah, just to make sure that, um, I let them know that I love them more, you know, more than, than, than they might think. Um, so that's probably been one of the biggest things I think is to, I don't know if it's just, like you said, I, I've got a little bit, so, I've definitely got softer. Um, the, the older, older I've got, um, and I realize there, there's more to life than, um, just maybe being successful and stuff at what you do. Uh, success comes in so many different ways mm. and um, 
my yeah my my not my not my values have changed but like my my priorities have probably changed as well in terms of you know what what I want to actually do and what I want to actually achieve and um it all revolves around people generally because I think people are the most important thing in the world and we need to be really really conscious of that and like competition is good competition is great but competition and working together is probably even greater and mm-hmm. we need to do more of that we need to work together we need to help each other out we need to congratulate each other we need to give good feedback um so so yeah i think it all revolves around people for me and relationships and building those more and um yeah giving p- people permission to to do the same i think that's important you know like it's okay to be soft. It's okay to be nice. It's okay to congratulate people. It's okay to do these things um, because it actually makes people feel good and it makes them want to do more better things themselves. So yeah, hopefully that kind of answers the question. Great. Yeah, very much. So, and I see a lot of that in you. So we've got two more questions. What, what excites you about the future and, and where do you see yourself? Uh, geez, I'm so excited, but um First of all, I'm excited about a change, you know, moving to another country will be amazing. Being on the European mainland will just be epic road trips and, and these sort of yeah. things. Starting a family is going to be amazing. Like I feel like there's that part of me that I, that I don't quite understand yet. And like, I don't understand maybe about other people and the dynamics of families well enough because I don't have my own kids and I really, really look forward to that. Um, I'm really excited about getting pets. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but I yeah. can't wait to have dogs. <laughs> um, I can't wait to see. Are you there, bud? I'm here. Okay, sorry. Um, I can't wait to see where you and I go uh, with the podcast. Like, you know, it's such a big part of our life, mm. my life, your life. And I'm just really, really excited about where this whole journey is going to go. It's going to be amazing. Um, and yeah, I'm, those are the main things I'm really excited about, I think. Um, and yeah, just getting out there more in the world again, you know, like I feel like um, I have this um, thing inside me that wants to go out and really connect with people and connect with the world and nature and stuff. And um, mm. Um, just make the most of make the most of time, but time is so short. You and I are yeah, constantly mate. reminded yeah. week in and week out that uh, life is short and we need to make the most of it. Yeah, but so true, man. Well said. So, my man, what does it mean to you to be ridiculously human? <laughs> it's so weird. Like I didn't even think about this question. I thought of sort of <laughs> thought about it um, a little bit more. Like about two questions ago, I was like, "Oh yeah, Flip, he's, he's going to ask, ask. question." <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I should have like a, a really good answer <laughs> um, from the heart, my man. For me, being ridiculously human is a few things. First of all, it's about understanding who you are as a person. I think there's nothing more powerful about being really, really, really honest about who you are and where you've come from, right? You, once you're able to get to that state, um, or even like if you're on that journey, you're then able to um, offer so much more to the world and, and just to be so much more honest and authentic with, um, with uh, what you can offer. And for being ridiculously human, I think is for being a rock solid person that people can rely on without even having to think about it. Hmm. People that can come to you and know that you are going to give them 100% support, but also 100% unbiased unbiased opinion on things. Mm -hmm. Uh, You will tell them the truth about a situation and you will only tell them that truth because you want the best for them. You're Mm -hmm. not going to tell them what they want to hear. You're going to tell them what you feel is the right thing to say. 
and mm. what will help them ultimately. So being honest, loving deeply and having people's backs. That's what being ridiculously human means to me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, my man. Flippin' best answer ever. No, <laughs> Second, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, wow, this has been an amazing chat. Uh, let me just take a moment just to say thank you because it it has been really, really great for me. Uh, and I uh, hope it's been good for you. Your Your story, it reminds me of how much courage you have. Um, and... Um, but courage sort of backed with a, with an, with a, a plan that that's, that's you, you know, <laughs> and I love it. Um, so thanks so much for sort of taking the time to, to share your story with us and with me. Um, I think it's been a valuable exercise for us um, to be a little bit selfish here. Uh, the changes I've seen in myself since we've, we've been able to spend so much time together even if it's virtual, um, is a real testament to your positive influence in others. And uh, I'm, I'm like eternally grateful for that. There's no real words to, to, to thank you for that. Um, and I also, yeah, just, just so many of the positive things in my life I credit to you nowadays, uh, which, is, which is an amazing thing. And I, I think that's a, an influence you have on a lot of people, not just me. I'm just lucky that I get to sp speak hundreds of voice messages with you every week. <laughs> um, and, but you're also more, you, you more than that. You're a flipping machine. You, you have, there's very few people out there that I've met that is, that are as organized and as switched on as you are. And your, your work ethic is literally second to none. You, you, yeah, it, it's like, I have to keep up, you know what I mean? Cause, and it's great for me, but, but it's amazing. Like you can, you've got this laser focus <clears throat> and it's quite an amazing thing to, to behold really. <laughs> and, um, and there's no ways that we would be doing this podcast with your, uh, without your tenacity and your drive and your, your encouragement and your support and your love. It's, it's, it's you know, so, so thank you so much uh, for that. Um, you also the most congruent person I, I know. So you were mentioning in that earlier and in your sort of ridiculously human answer and I can attest to that. So you're, you're always honest and you constantly ensuring that you're living up to your values um, and you self regulating, self checking. And that's a, f a great skill to have. And I'm trying to be more like that because of you. So that that's amazing. And so, so thanks for stimulating the best in others always. Uh, I really want to grow this podcast for a few reasons. One of them is, I hope that we can grow this podcast uh, really big so that more people get uh, a shot at getting a chance to meet someone like you. And that, that's, that's cool. You know, so more people should meet people like you. So yeah, that's, that's one of my wishes for this. And uh, just thanks for everything, my man. But man, you, you're just such a flipping amazing bloke. Seriously. Like, <laughs> um, I, I can't begin to explain to you like how much that means to me, what you just said. Like it's, it's, it's so nice having that reflection from, from somebody else. And, um, you know, I know that everything you say is just like always straight from the heart, always super honest. And I can't begin to tell you how much this means to me as well, but because we do come from different places in terms of like how we do things and how we operate and how we think. And I love your mind and like um, how you analyze and, and give feedback on, on different situations. And it, it just, it's just huge for me, bud. And that's why I always ring you up first for advice. You know, like especially lately, there's been a few instances and I'm like, but what do you think of this? Can you please tell me and stuff? And it's just, it's huge for me, bud. So there's, you know, there's so much love and grit gratitude uh from me to you as well and thanks, thanks for making this chat such an awesome one but i've read you've given me like i don't know just such a nice comfortable platform to actually speak from and you know we both know that there's there's a lot more 
um, things to discuss and, and mm. we, we will get onto these things that, that are probably that layer deeper that, yes. um, um, that is important to get to. Um, but uh, this has been like such an amazing first round of it. And I just sure. appreciate you more than anything. You're definitely my long lost brother. And I'm just so <laughs> grateful that for that weekend in Ibiza, but because otherwise, yeah. you know, who knows, my <laughs> man. <laughs> so thank you so Thanks, much. Man. Love you, my man. Thanks for everything. But there is one more thing. I do think we should encourage everyone to do this kind of exercise. Um, maybe not to record it, even though I think that's a great idea to actually do, but maybe with your friend, your best friend or your mom or your dad, um, go in with a clean slate and just listen and hear someone else's story. And I think you'll both be blown away with what might emerge. So I think that's just something that I'd like to just leave with, with everybody. Yeah, that's great, uh, great advice. And I totally agree with it, but like, it's so, for us, we find it so beneficial and um, you'll find out things and you'll probably appreciate people so much more than you actually do now. And mm -hmm. uh, just through lis listening to them and hearing their story and what they've gone through. So it's a great exercise, man. And we're going to do it more and more. Yeah. Thanks, my man. my man. Thanks, buddy. Cheers, buddy. Woo. Bye. <laughs> Cheers, bud. Bye. <laughs> Woo. -hoo. Well done, my boy. Well done, my man. Thanks so much, bud. That was really awesome. Awesome, man. So well, well done, bud. Um, really, I know. I know we went on a little longer. I could have, but I wanted you to get your full story out, bud. So. Oh, thanks, man. Um, yes, is no, no, a I, long one, but it was awesome, bud. Thank you, man. No, it's great, bud. No, no, really great. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much, man. That was great questions, bud, as well. Really great questions. Pleasure, bud. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy Cape Fall.